God glory this morning, man. And we want to welcome everybody to River of Life, and we're just so glad that you're here. You can be, um, you can be seated, and um, but we just, you know, um, today is a day that the Lord has made, Amen. And I will rejoice. And I will be glad, Amen. You know what? If we just do those two things, we'll have a good day. You know what I mean? Or you can, or you can get mad and get angry, and you can go complain. Which, which would you rather do? I'd rather be glad, and I'd rather rejoice. Amen. So um, we want to welcome everybody. And if you're watching this morning, we want to welcome you, and we just thank you that you're um, with us in our service. I know, not physically, but spiritually, we know that you're here and you're watching. During the service, if you have prayer requests, just write them in and we'll stand and we'll, we'll pray and we'll stand. And we know where two or three agree on anything, you know, God will move in that situation. Um, really quick, some really quick announcements. Next Sunday, on the 12th, at 4 o'clock, 4 to 8 o'clock, will be Community Faith in the Park. And it'll be between 4 to 8 p.m. next Sunday. There'll be guest speakers. Um, there'll be food trucks, uh, praise and worship, testimonies. And you'll be there. The community will come out, and they will be blessed because you are there. And where you are, the Spirit of the Lord is. So that is so, so important that we know that. Wherever we go, we have our testimonies, and the Spirit is with you. And I think... I think Jesus picked up the Bible and went to the Old Testament, and he said something. He says, you are anointed, amen, to preach the news, set the captives free. So, and all anointing comes from him. So if you're scared, you're shy, you're timid, don't worry about it. Jesus will take care of it, all right? So, uh, tell somebody, pray somebody. Um, invite your friends. Hey, let's go down there and, and buy them dinner and get them out there and... And we're going to have a really awesome time. And it's time for us to take, you know, we've been given so many opportunities in this city with the school, even before they even built the high school and all that. Um, this, is, this, is, this is God's town, amen? This is his city. He's paid a price for it already. And this is our park. And we need, this is, we need to Take, stand up and take control of it, and we'll speak over it, and we'll speak over these lives. And they're going to come, and they're going to they're going to they're going to receive life. Uh, the ones that don't know Jesus Christ, when they come Saturday night, they're going to receive something. Amen. And we stand, and we agree with it. They're going to they're going to receive life. Um, another announcement: We have a few different changes the way we're doing things. Since our children are way in the back, um, before you leave today, we'll. Before you hit those two doors to go outside, there's going to be some little kids there, and they're going to ask you to empty your pockets. <laughs> and all of this will go for all the Christmas, everything that we do all over, all over the world. And we just give God glory. And uh, so before you leave today, if you brought change, I know a couple already came up to me. What am I going to do for all my change? The kids will be at the, at the door. And they'll receive all your change that you have. And so you can come before, you can come up here and lay all your burdens down. Then you can give all your change to the kids, and you'll walk out this day so much lighter and so much free. <laughs> Amen? You know, I'm telling you, we serve a good God. I mean, he's, a, he's an awesome God. So he, he, he's got it he's taken care of. Amen? Um <laughs> We want to lift up each and every one that's not here today, um, the ones that, and we know that God's going to touch them. He's going to heal. Them. He's going to make them completely whole. And we give our God and our Lord Jesus is He's our God is our healer, and we know that he, Jesus is touching them right now. And we just want to lift up each and every one. You look around today, and uh, lift them up in prayer. And we know that God's going to touch them and heal them. We don't take up our tithes and offering, but we, Right, there's baskets at the door, and at the end of the service, just drop off your tithes and your offerings. And um, we know that God is going to take care of your, all your needs. 
He is Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider, and and he'll take care of everything. Um, here in a minute, we're going to call the elders. I want to read a scripture. How many know that our Redeemer, our Redeemer lives? Amen? He lives. And if you're watching today in Hebrews, and I'll tell you why he lives. I'll tell you in Hebrews um, chapter 7, verse 25, it says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Whatever you're going through today, my Redeemer lives, your Redeemer lives, and he lives to make intercession on your behalf. Whatever you're going through this morning, he is interceding on your behalf right now. Reach out and just touch him this morning. Reach out and call him. He knows your name, and if you call out his name and call out to Jesus this morning, if the ground is shaky and he is a rock and he is a firm foundation, if there's storms, he is peace. Whatever you have need of, just call out to him, and he is there for you. And we just give God all glory for him today. May you give God the glory today. We're going to turn the lights. We're going to hit the lights. We're going to ask the elders to, to come. And if you have any a need today, and it says call for the elders because they're sick among you, and the elders will lay hands and anoint with oil, and you will be healed. Amen. So whatever you're going through, the elders will come. And praise, if the praise team will just start pl- playing something. And during this, just start praising God. Just start going into praise and worship and thanking Him. Amen. Thanking Him for what He's already done. It says, by my stripes ye are healed. Amen. He's already done it. So all you need to do is come up and start confessing with your mouth. I am healed, amen, by the stripes of Jesus. I'll live and I'll not die, amen. I'll breathe and I'll breathe with the breath of God, amen. And just give God all the glory. And just start praising Him right now, church. Let's just raise, lift your hands. It says, my strength comes from up on high, amen. My help is on high, amen. So this morning, as we're good, as we're praying for them, just start, just start worshiping, worshiping Him. Just praise Him for what He is. He is the great I Am. Amen.
kingdom yours is the power yours in the glory forever amen oh yours in the kingdom yours in the power yours in the glory forever amen oh yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours is the glory forever amen oh yours is the kingdom yours is the power yours in the glory forever amen yes. hallelujah Just raise your hand right now and give give the Lord just a praise offering. And we'll just give God all the honor and all the glory for everything. You be seated just for a moment. And uh, we're getting ready to go into our praise and worship. And I really encourage you to praise and worship the Lord this morning. He is worthy of all of our praise. Every bit of it. I mean, if you could just dig down to the deepest part of your inner person and pull out everything. He's worthy of all of our praise. And we want to give it to him. Before we uh, go into our praise and worship, I'm going to show you three slides, three pictures. How many of you remember last week we um, told you about Irfan, I-R-F-A-N, Irfan, uh, his wife and their two children um, are from Pakistan they worked and were slaves uh, in the brickyards. And Irfan uh, was not able to produce uh, over 3,000 bricks every day. These are, you do this by hand. And the owner of the brickyard had been speaking vulgar to his wife and touching her. Just nothing that Irfan can do. And Anila Zia, who works with us in Pakistan, she emailed us and said, is there any way we can buy the freedom for this family? And that freedom was like $1,300, basically paying off all of his indebtedness to the brickyard owners, getting that all clear, and then the brickyard owner being willing to release him after he had received his money. And then we needed $500 more in order to help Irfan have a business because if you don't set them up in a business, sometimes they'll end up back in the brickyards because it's all they know. They, they have no other way of making a living. And so last night, this is the three pictures that I got. Are you guys ready? All right, show me the first one. All right, there's Irfan and his ice cola shop. All right. So she said, well, we bought him an ice ball machine. So I was trying to think, what's an ice ball machine? I think, well, I guess that's a snow cone machine. I don't know. But that's his business. The next one. All right. There's all the flavors. God knows that we don't get that many here. All right. One more. All right. And there they are. And you can see the machine. And so... <clears throat> Within a week, he's free from slavery. His, his wife is free from slavery. His children are free from slavery. He's got his own business now. Isn't that amazing what God does? And, and that's, that's because of your faithfulness. And uh, I think that's the sixth family uh, that we've been able to buy out of bondage and out of slavery. And I'm telling you, 
I, I just wish I'd take the whole day and show you hundreds and hundreds of pictures that they send me every day um, of what they're doing uh, in that part of the country. So thank you so much for your love, for your faithfulness, and for willing to be a church that thinks outside its own four walls. A lot of churches don't think outside the four walls of their building. You do, and that's the kind of result that you get. And uh, now the reason I want to show this is because this morning I'm going to be talking about rewards, the rewards that God gives you. And whether you realize it or not, you're just getting some points towards some of your rewards <laughs> all right, as to what you're doing. Amen. Amen. So, Brother Jeremy, someday we'll go over there and we'll have an, an ice ball. <laughs> all right, let's all, let's all stand. We're going to worship the Lord this morning. Yes, hallelujah. Amen. He is risen, amen. Yes, amen. Saturday was silent, truly it was true. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? Friday's disappointment, Sunday's empty too. Since when has impossible ever stopped you? This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Is the praise make a dead man walk again? Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. In a costume fire, stirring something new. You're not gonna run out of miracles anytime soon. Resurrection power runs in my veins through. I believe there's another miracle here in this room. This is the sign of dry bones out of This is the praise that can dead man walk again. Hope in the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. My God is able to save and deliver and heal and restore anything. That he wants to Just ask the man That was thrown On the bones of Elijah If there's anything That he can't do Just ask the stone That was rolled At the tomb in the garden What happens When God says Boom I feel moving Now I feel In the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. I said, Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. I said, Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I hear the sound. Sound. And I hear the sound. I hear the sound. And I hear the sound. Oh, I hear the sound. Yeah, I hear the sound. Don't hear the word of the Lord. 
Lord, I said, live. Drop live. on to the word of the Lord, I said, live. Drop live. Live. on to the word of the Lord, I said, live. Drop on to the word of the Lord, this is the sign to drop on rattling. This is the praise that can dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. I said, open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Metal. sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm bound. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me oh i once was lost but now i'm found i was blind but now i see and this is the sound of dry bones this is the praise make a dead man walk again Open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. I said, open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. I said, open the grave, I'm coming out, I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones that are there. This is the praise that the dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. I said, open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of dry bones rattling. Hallelujah. We serve a risen God. Amen. Give Him glory this morning. Hallelujah.
the God of the valley. There's not a place of mercy and grace to find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing.
I'm ready for a miracle, God, let it be this time. But if I never see the promise on this side of the grave, my hope might be shaken, my faith will never break. Because I know the day is coming, you'll right all of the wrong. Now praise you in the waiting, my faith is strong. God, you taught me to trust you, showed me how to believe. You're the author and the finisher of what you started me, so I'm not gonna doubt it. Gonna hold on to peace Cause if I have you and nothing else I still have everything And if I never see the promise On this side of the grave My hope might be shaken My faith will never break Cause I know the day is coming You'll right all of the wrong so I'll praise you in the waiting. My faith will stay strong. I'll count it all joy when I'm tested. Cause you bring beauty from my pain. It's never wasted. Cause if I never see the promise on this side of the grave. My hope might be shaken, my faith will never break. Because I know the day is coming, you'll right all of the wrong. Now I'll praise you in the waiting, my faith will stay strong.
Isn't it amazing that the entirety of the scriptures, all the prophets that was to be sent, and ultimately Jesus to come into this world, was to fulfill this very promise to Abraham. Isn't that amazing? God is so faithful. And if He is that faithful to keep His promise to one person, how much more is He going to keep His promise to you and me through the blood of Jesus Christ? 
You don't realize everything in the Scripture is based upon Jesus fulfilling His promise to one man, to Abraham. And Paul says in Galatians, he said, you, through Christ, are now an heir of Abraham. And you are an heir according to the promises that was given to Abraham. God promised to bring him home one day from all the wandering. And guess what? That promise is unto you and me today as well. One day he's going to bring us home from all the wandering in this world and the back and the forth. And he's going to protect us and be there for us. And what an incredible, incredible blessing and place we are in Christ. He is so incredibly good to us. And I love Him. I want to sing that verse part again. And I'm going to bring you home. Because I don't know about you, but the idea that one day I'm going to be with Him for eternity. Woo! The older I get, the sweeter that sounds. <laughs> Amen. One day to be with Him forever. And oh man, I'm telling you. That day is going to be there for all of us, sooner or later. Amen. Let's just worship the Lord with Him. Remember, He made a promise to Abraham to bring him home. You are an heir to Abraham. So one day He has promised, I'm going to bring you home unto Myself. And there we shall ever be with Him. Amen. Let's worship the Lord again. of death and it's been going on forever guys but we are not to fear he told us don't fear he didn't give us fear and he said not to forsake the gathering together especially when you see the days at hand the days coming I don't know about y'all but I see it our Lord is coming back Guys, we can't fear. We've got to be stronger. We've got to be one together. This is the time we come together and not separate. Death has happened since the day that we were born, guys. People are going to die, but there's a promise. The promise that if we live in Christ, that we will have life. What happens on this this earth has nothing to do with our eternity if we are in Christ. If we are following Him and living by His Word. There is nothing that man can do to us. Death, hell, and the grave. Jesus has already defeated that. He is going to bring us back home. Bring us back home. This is not our home. This is temporary. This is not our home at all. We're just passerbys. We're aliens to this place. This is not our home.
at your neighbor and say, believe it or not, I have a departure date. <laughs> so go home and be with the Lord. <laughs> oh, we may not like to look at it that way, but listen. The scripture says all of our days are numbered, every one of them that would be, even before they are. Oh, hallelujah. I'm telling you, God is so good to us. Amen. You can be seated. I'll tell you what I... Yes. We are in the world, but not of it. Amen. He's always been in control, and he always will be in control. So the things that we see that trouble us so much, just have peace and joy in knowing that God is in control. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, I'm used to letting the kids come roam through here and get money right now, so <laughs> everything is changing. On your bulletin, um, we have the, the uh, community faith in the park uh, Sunday, September. So what I'm encouraging you to do is take your bulletin home or take your bulletin with you. And uh, if you're going to a restaurant today in the area, leave it on the table, okay? And they're very simple ways of doing things. Just leave it on the table. And if you really want to get somebody aggravated with you, put it under their windshield wiper. <laughs> uh, just hand it to somebody, give it to somebody, leave it on a table, uh, and it's a way of just letting people in our area know what we're doing. And hopefully they may want to come and be a part of it, okay? So a lot of little ways that we can do things. Amen. Well, today uh, I told you to bring your notebooks and uh, your pen and paper because uh, we're going to... Look into some areas that we don't really uh, minister on a, an enormous amount. And I'm praying that, uh, I've prayed all week about it, and I've said, Lord, just give me the wisdom uh, to present it in a right way and a way that everybody understands. And I believe God's going to honor that. Um uh, pretty amazing. Have you ever wondered about what you do while you're here on earth? If it really matters? I mean, there are some people who will go through their whole life and feel like everything they've done doesn't really amount to anything. And many times they'll feel like they're a complete, total failure. The Scripture says that what we do in this world makes a difference. Now, we as Christians, what we normally do, we normally feel that if I have met and Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, that that's really all that I have to worry about, okay? I, I'm saved, I'm born again, uh, I'm going to heaven. Now, there's no question that's the most important thing that we can do in our life is have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I don't want you to think that I am somehow undermining that or demeaning it. I'm not. It's the most important decision in your life is to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. I believe it's also extremely important that the Lord Jesus be not just only your Savior, but that He be your Lord. And many times people have a little bit harder time understanding the, the difference between the two. When you came to Jesus, you asked Jesus to forgive you of all of your sins. And Jesus was just. He was merciful. And because of His grace, He saved you and forgave you of all of your sins. After I spent my time with Christ at the altar, or wherever you may have spent that moment, whether it was in your car, uh, in your living room, out in the open field, somewhere you said, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and come into my life. 
From that moment, my heart was as white as snow. All sin had been forgiven. So Jesus was indeed my Savior. Tori, he saved me from an ultimate destruction called hell. Eternal separation from him. But then there is another portion that a lot of times we don't talk about, and that is making Jesus the Lord of your life. The Scripture talks about sanctifying our life, living a life of holiness before the Lord. And what the Scripture is saying is that at some point, and I've shared this over the years, at some point we say, Lord, thank you for saving me, and now I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be everything in my life, and I totally separate myself from this earthly world as far as the desires of the flesh, and I Put my faith now totally in you. That is making him the Lord of our life. A little more difficult. Because, see, being saved seems to be a one-time, I don't want to, I hope I get it the right way. It's a, a one moment in my life to where I say, Jesus, forgive me. And I receive you as my Lord. And I did that. I did it when I was 13 years old. Now, I had a lot of junk in my life over the years, but that moment when I said, Jesus, come into my life, He came into my life. And He guided my life. And I know now, as I reflect back, there are multiple times that By man's standard, I should not be here, but God guided me through some very difficult, dark times. I'm sure if you gave your testimony today, there's times and darkness periods in your life that you know, and when you get on the other side of them, you look back and you say, oh, but only by the grace of God. Only by His grace did I make it through those periods. Only by His grace. But making Him Lord of your life to where you are totally committed unto Him, that's not a one-time thing. That's an everyday process. That means in the morning when I get up, I've got to say, Lord, today you are Lord of my life. Direct my steps because I want to be pleasing unto you today. I want to hear your voice today. I want to hear what you would have me do today. I want to be a witness for you today. I want to say something or do something that would change somebody's life today. That's not... Something that we just haphazardly do. We, we do it with intention. Every day, God, I'm setting myself apart unto you. When I get up in the morning, I have my own earthly agenda. Nancy asks me every morning when we get up, what are you going to do today? What are you going to do today? And I usually have a pretty good list of what I want to do. I've narrowed it down a lot lately, but I I used to have a pretty good list of everything I wanted to do. But now I'm, I'm realizing more and more that my list really is secondary. The most important thing is what you, Lord, want me to do today. Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to? What do, what do you want me to do as being a witness? So what we do in this life has eternal consequences. Well, I'm saved, so once I die, I'm on the other side, so everything over here doesn't make any difference what I did or didn't do. But, oh, yes, it does make a difference what we do or don't do this side of the grave. Let me look at the Word. There's a good deal of confusion. How many of you realize 
that there is a difference between a gift and a reward. What's the difference? I'm going to put you all on the spot today because I need help preaching this. All right. All right. One is earned, one is not. Which is which? Huh? You earn the reward. Okay. <laughs> but the gift is what? It's free. The Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm jumping all over the place right now, so I may end up using this one again. The Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, He said that we are all because of the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ. We've all been given the gift of salvation. And He goes on and says that no man can earn it lest we would what? Boast about it. Look what I've done to earn this. Paul says you've not earned this. This is a gift from God. But the Scripture says that God is a rewarder of those who will diligently seek after Him. So you and I are experiencing a free gift right now. Of salvation. But there will come a day when we stand before Jesus that He will hand out the rewards to you and I for what we have done in this life. And Paul will make it very plain what we've done in the body. So sometimes there's a lot of confusion. That's where I'm going. All right. In your bulletin, on the inside, I put two pictures. One is a picture of the judgment seat of Christ, which is what we're going to talk about. And the other one is the great white throne judgment. What's the difference between these two? The judgment seat is going to be for believers. The great white throne judgment will be for the unbelievers. And they were, at that place, they will be cast into utter darkness. But the judgment seat of Christ is where Christ is going to give His rewards for you and I of how we've lived this life here. So, what I want to share with you today is very simple. When we come to Christ, that is not the end. When you come to Christ, that is the beginning. And the songs that were sung tonight, today, I could not have asked them to do any other song than what they've done. They're perfect for what I believe God is sharing with me. Because in this side of the world, of the grave, there are things that I do not understand. There are things that I have absolutely no answer for. I don't have them. I remember when I would be at Parkland and as a chaplain and I'd be there and a, a young couple would, uh, uh, I'd get called over and a young couple, their baby was three days old, four days old, and the baby had died. And the mother looked and said, Chaplain, why? Crystal, I don't have an answer. I wasn't going to sit there and try to make up some spiritual dialogue with them. I don't know. I don't have an answer. Why does some reprobate live to be a hundred and some precious saint live to be thirty? I don't know. I don't have the answer. Jeremy, I'd give anything if I had the answer to those. But I don't. And I have preachers tell me all the time, well, if you just had more faith. No, I know some who had all the faith in the world and something tragic happened to them or happened in their home and family. 
I had friends that had faith, faith enough to live in some of the most volatile areas, faith enough to know that their life was in mortal danger because they believed God called them there to preach the Word of God, and it cost them their life. And then someone will say, well, they didn't have enough faith. Well, what is enough faith? To be willing to lay down your life for your brother. The Bible says there's no greater, no greater love or gift that a man can give. So I know they had faith. But the song was saying that even though we don't understand what's going on, and even though some of our promises aren't answered every time we pray, Still, our faith becomes strong because we know whom we have believed. And Paul says in Romans, I know whom I have believed on and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. When I came to Jesus Christ, when you came to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you committed yourself unto the Lord, I'm telling you, no devil in hell had the power or the right or the authority to take that away. You've given it to God. He sits with it at the right hand of the Father and He says I am here and it is protected. But that doesn't mean that you're going to get all the rewards. You're going to get the gift. Heaven is your home. Look at two scriptures. On the great white throne judgment, many people believe that Christians are not subject to any of the judgments because their sins have been covered by the blood of Christ. That's true. But there are verses in the scripture. Let me share with you. Romans 14, 10 through 12. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Paul was speaking unto believers. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. In both the contexts, Paul is preaching to believers and not unbelievers. So how is this going to work? That means after Jesus raptures us out of here and we stand before Him, He's going to look at what we've done. And I'm going to stand before Him and He's saying, I don't know how He's going to word it, but I'm just going to paraphrase what I think. He's going to look at me and He's going to say, Paul, I'm so glad you chose me to be your Savior. And to be your Lord. And it's a good thing that you've done that. Because you've done that, you're in this judgment and not in the other one. The white throne judgment. And I'm glad you've made that choice. I've got five crowns over here. Scripture brings out five. And he said, the one crown you probably aren't going to get simply because you weren't willing to be persecuted unto death. Now, there's some going to get that crown because they've given their life. They've been martyrs for Jesus. And he said, I would love to give you that crown of a a brand new raiment and a a crown of righteousness and, and all of these other things that I've got here. He said, but the only issue is you got saved And I forgave you of your sins, but you sat down and didn't do anything. You never talked to anybody about me. You never really went out of your way to help anybody. You didn't really fulfill the Word of God the way I really wanted you to. You were short. 
Now, the gift is yours. I gave you the gift, and I'm not going to take the gift back. But I really would have liked to have been able to give you all these crowns as well. Because I want you to rule and reign with me for a thousand years. And your position in that reign, that thousand year kingdom, will be determined by what we've done here on this earth. And the crowns that have been given unto us that we've received. So it's important what we do in this world for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know you're looking at me like today is like, no, I don't want to hear this kind of sermon. <laughs> but I want you to bear with me because it's so important. One of the purposes of the body of Christ is that you and I are made ready to rule with Christ for the thousand year reign. That's one of the church's responsibilities. So when I come up to you with a gift, and uh, or, uh, let's say a calling in your life, and you're doing something in church, and, and I see that you're not doing what you need to be doing, and I come up to you and say, hey, I think we need to do it a little bit different. I think you need to have a little bit more uh, concern uh, about the group or whatever it might be. That is not a condemnation, nor is it a chastisement, but I'm helping you get to the place to where you're going to be effective doing what God has called you to do because the more effective you are in your calling, the greater the chances are that you're going to get all five of the crowns. Now, there's no condemnation for those of us who love God. We're called according to His purpose. But my challenge today is that I don't want us just to be a, a, a Christian that says, yes, I'm saved and, and everything is going to be all right. But I want us to be believers who are willing to roll up our sleeves and go to work for the kingdom of God and build the kingdom of God and, and help change people's lives. Amen. We went through an entire part time during the church, and, and I understood what it was all about, and, and, and I'm not totally against it, but there is a concept of uh, what they called servanthood evangelism. And that basically, basically means you live the good life as a Christian, and those around you will ultimately see the goodness on your life and will ask their way, how are you so good? And you say, because of Jesus Christ. And they'll say, well, I want Jesus in my life. Now, there's, there's some reality to that. Because there are some countries to where you cannot minister the Word of God with your mouth. You can only live the life in front of people hoping they will ask about the life you're living. But in our country, you and I every day have an opportunity to share the message of Jesus Christ with people. And it's not just by my lifestyle. But it's by me actively letting people know about Jesus Christ. And letting them know that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of righteousness is eternal life with Jesus Christ. We have got to be more adamant about our faith. Our faith has to become public. It can't be hidden only in the four walls of the church. It cannot be hidden and brought out only at a small group meeting. Or on Sunday morning and Wednesday night when we come to the house of God. We have got to begin to let our Christian life speak loudly wherever we go. Well, how do we do that? There's a lot of ways to do it. One way is just to let people know, witness to people about Jesus. Another way is just being careful how we present ourselves. 
If I'm going to win somebody to Christ, I'm not going to use every four-letter word in the book. Except love. We witness every day of our life in thousands of ways. There are times when, when you and I, we go in a place and we get in a line and, you know, somebody just jumps in front of you and, and you know, you want to snatch them, you know, and put them back in place. But you don't do it. We live our life. A business friend of mine says, well, I can't be a, a really true believer and be a businessman because they'll walk all over me. Well, they won't walk all over you. Will some take advantage? Yeah, probably will. But if you're dedicated and committed unto Christ, I promise you, Jesus will make it up one way and or the other. He'll always be there for you and He'll make it but he just make it up. So the next contract you get is three times bigger than any of you ever had. Amen. Or you end up with the biggest contract you've ever had in your business. God will always make a way. But we have to live that life. Because those are the things we're going to be measured with. I'm going to be measured by how I present Jesus Christ. And how I'm willing to work. To build the kingdom of God. <laughs> I'm, when we do all of our programs, our youth, uh, uh, our children's church, uh, the small groups, none of this, listen to me and hear my heart, and you got to hear me the right way. None of those are to build this church. They are to build God's kingdom. And the more you build God's kingdom, the more God builds His church. Because it's putting Him first and everything else on a different level and a different plane. It's about His kingdom. Because see, that broadens my ability to minister the Word of God. Because now, not only am I building His kingdom, but in the process, I'm building First Baptist, I'm building Hillcrest, I'm building River of Life, I'm building the Methodist Church, I'm building all these around about me. Why? Because God is honoring us building His kingdom. And He made a statement in Matthew, He said, If you will build My kingdom, I will build My church, and hell will not prevail against it. Amen? So we've got to understand, we will stand and give an account. The Christian church has went through a a, a whole period of time thinking that because we know Jesus, nobody will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That is not scriptural. We will not stand before the white throne judgment. Why? Our sins have been eradicated and will not be judged for our sin. What we're going to be judged for with... Christ is what we have done while we're here as a believer. As a believer. Amen. So my question to us today is, what is God saying for us? I have to ask myself, Lord, what, what would you say that day that I stand before you? I, I'm hoping that ultimately, at the end of it, he's going to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the kingdom and the joys of the Lord. That's my desire more than anything. I want to hear that. But that's going to be at, at the judgment seat of Christ. And he's going to look at all of my works. And I know that, that some of my works, listen, I'm just going to be as open and as honest with you. God has thumped me so hard the last few weeks about different things in my life. And one of the things that he's going to ask, well, I believe he'll ask me, Paul, why, why did you do what you did?
Did you do it for me? Or did you do it for you? Did you do it to build my kingdom or did you do it only to build your church? Did you do it to build my kingdom or did you do it because you wanted man to look all the good things that you can do or have done? I want the Lord to be able to look at me and and judge the motives of my heart and know that my heart was right before God. Not that it was always pure, because I promise you, my heart probably has not always been pure because I've had thoughts of, of frustration and anger and bitterness and resentment and a lot of things that come into your life every day that we walk through this life, things that are there. But I want you to realize that God is going to challenge us. And He's going to look and check our motives. Paul, did you do it just because you wanted to be right? Did you argue with that other denomination because you felt you were right and they were wrong and you just had a point to prove? I don't have to prove any point. Every point is already in the Word of God. I just walk by what God reveals to me. I believe His Word. And to the best of my ability, I want the Lord to say that day, Paul, to the best of your ability, I see that you have walked in my Word. And because you've walked in my Word, I've got a, I've got a robe of righteousness for you. And when you get into my kingdom and you rule with me for the thousand years, I'm going to make you a ruler with me. Can you imagine? And I'm, I, I, I just can't do it hardly because of this world. Can you imagine a thousand years of just peace? Crystal, no wars, no rumors of wars anymore, peace, and everything that we see out here, the world will just continue, but it's all going to be a thousand years of peace, and everything is going to be met, every need is going to be supplied, and we're going to rule with righteousness, and Christ is going to be the head ruler, and all the governments will be upon His shoulders, and you and I are going to be His workmen that rule with Him. I Beyond my comprehension. Because we've never had that kind of peace. What we have is the opposite. Wars and rumors of wars. Countries out after each other. Greed. Taking each other's land. Just because they're bigger and they're stronger. Murdering all the time. What account will we give? We'll be judged based on what we have built upon the foundation of Christ. Now listen, according to Paul in Ephesians, according to the grace of God which is given unto me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereupon. That foundation that was laid in your life is Jesus Christ. Paul will make a statement. He says that, Jesus reconciled men back unto the Father, but you're to reconcile men unto the Lord. I've laid a foundation. I've let you know that Jesus Christ is the only way and the only answer. I've laid that foundation. I think almost everybody in this room today has had that foundation laid in your life because to my knowledge, everybody in here knows Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you don't, then you need to get that foundation laid in your life right now. Because without a foundation, nothing is going to stand. Christ is that foundation. But let's go on a little bit further. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, 
costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. Their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light, the judgment seat of Christ. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. We make choices throughout our life. That foundation of Christ has been laid in your life. But how we build upon that foundation is imperative. If we build on it with wood, hay, and stubble, things that have not been tried, The Scripture says that those things will be gathered and bundled together and they'll be cast into the fire and they'll be consumed and it will be as though you did nothing. Now, this is tough preaching. I know that. It won't amount to anything. But then Paul puts this in there. He said, but your soul will be saved. That foundation that's there will not go away. But everything you've done, if you've done it for the wrong motives, it's going to be gone. So what does the Scripture say? Build rather with gold and silver. Why gold and silver? Because gold and silver has to be tested by the fire. So some of you are going through a trial in your life. Peter says, count it all joy. Now that's not easy to do. You're about ready to lose your home or you're losing your job and uh, your, your family's falling apart. And, and Lord, I'm supposed to count this as joy? There's no way I can count this. He said, count it as joy, because where with that, God is going to work something in your life. And as He works that something in your life, it's going to change your life. And you're going to grow into the things of God. So, how do we build with silver and gold? Well, it's the best things that you can use. Because even in our monetary system today, the dollar ultimately gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And right now we're printing so much money that it's no wonder our inflation's where it's at right now. And that's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse, Kenny. So where is the value? The value is in something that has been tested and tried for thousands of years, and that's gold and silver and precious stones. So that's why most, most people, if they have any extra currency laying around, which right now is almost impossible, they look to invest it in gold or silver or stones because it's been tried and tested. When we go through trials in our life, we're being tried and tested. And it's silver that the dross ultimately is skimmed off the top. And then it brings up a a higher temperature and a little bit more comes to the surface and it's skimmed off the top. And after about three times for the smelter, the gold is pure without any impurities whatsoever. So sometimes the things that happen in our life are there to try us and to test us and to heat us up a little bit that we come out standing before Christ. And Christ says, I've tried your works. I see what you've done. And it wasn't wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, it wood isn't something just to be burned up because you had all the wrong motivations or you had the wrong desire, the wrong intent. But I see it as gold and pure. And uh, it's been through the fire. It's been through the testing. And you've been true and you've been faithful. And you've shared my name uh, to all those around about you. And now I've got a crown of life waiting for you because you were willing to be tried and willing to be tested. And don't get me wrong, I'm not asking you to leave here today and say, oh God, please test me or try me. That's not what I'm saying. 
Odds are you probably will be, all right, without me having you to ask for it. Because they come our way all the time. But we've got to raise a generation in our church that are not terrified of what may come against them sometimes. We've got to raise a generation that's not afraid when those at school call them holy rollers or, or Jesus freaks or whatever the term is that they use today. They may not be afraid that they've got something in them that causes them to stand. <coughs> when I was a boy, they used to always call me a holy roller at school. So I came up with my own defenses. I'd rather be a holy roller and roll my way into heaven than to walk my way into hell. That was my way of coming back at them. But we got to have a generation. It's not afraid of the things that come against them. We've got to have a generation that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and the first storm that comes against you, that you don't quit and give up. Because they're going to come. They're going to be there. You said it. We're in the world, but we're not of it. So these things are going to beat down upon us. We make these choices. We we rejoice in the trials so that our faith is proven genuine to the glory of God. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that The proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Everything that comes our way, we have to realize God is equipping us for something else. When I go through a trial... And I get through that trial. I realize that somewhere along the road there's another one that will come my way. But I don't run from it. Because I know God's grace is sufficient for everything I go through in my life. His grace is sufficient. I want us to be able to stand before Him on that white that day, that judgment seat of Christ. And I want us to be able to hear Him say, Well done, a good and faithful servant. Because see, those at the other judgment won't hear that. They're going to hear, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And you are cast into a lake of fire that has no end. That's why churches don't want to preach about hell. Who wants to preach about dying eternally and burning forever in a place called hell? That's not going to build my congregation. People don't want to hear that. But I'm telling you, we've got to understand Jesus is getting ready to return. All the signs are around about us as they've never been before. The prophecies are being laid out as they've never been before. Hitler was the Antichrist, they said. Look what he's doing. He's fulfilling Matthew 24. But yet Israel had not even become a nation yet. And Israel would have to be a nation for all of these prophetic words to become true. But now she has been for the last, since 48. And now all of the other prophecies are coming to pass. We live in an end time. 
Well, we've been hearing this for generations and generations. And Peter said, don't you know that one day is a thousand years unto the Lord? It's just like yesterday that he left. And though we've been hearing it for thousands of years, in reality it's only been a few. If that long. Thank you. So today I want to share that with you. Have we escaped the corruption that is of this world? Or have we succumbed to the things of the flesh? Every day I keep asking myself, Lord, what else can I do? To be closer to you. To serve you more. A second function of the judgment seat is that God's rewarding us for our service and our good deeds. Believers, we will receive crowns for different things based on how we faithfully we serve Christ. Among the crowns, we will receive an imperishable crown. Paul talks about it, a crown that will not fade away. And he uses the Olympics and he said uh, the, the runner, the boxer, uh, the participant, he, he works and he labors that he might win a crown that will perish. Olive leaves. He said, but we run a race for a crown that is imperishable and will not corrupt. You will wear a crown one day. And I remember the songs my mom used to sing about wearing crowns. But one day we will wear a crown. And we will rejoice with Jesus. It will be an imperishable crown. I'm looking for the crown that I'm going to receive. And it's going to be a crown of rejoicing. I'm going to have an imperishable crown that will never fade away. I'm going to have a crown of rejoicing. And I'm going to spend eternity rejoicing and celebrating. And even my praise and worship unto Him will not be about the trials on this earth, but they're going to be about everything that He is. He's going to get 100% of all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. It's going to be all about Him, and it's not going to be about anything else. A crown of rejoicing. I'm going to receive a crown of righteousness. I'm going to receive a crown of glory. But I'm also going to receive a crown of life. How many of you want to receive that crown of life? I don't want to get into heaven by the skin of my teeth. I want to go in with five crowns on the top of my head. That I've got everything that God has for me. And that I'll rule and reign with Him for that thousand years. And then when that thousand years is over, I'll be with Him for eternity. I want to rule with Him in a brand new Jerusalem. That's going to come down out of the sky. And when that thousand year is over and and the enemy's been loosened and he's been finally destroyed, then this earth will be annihilated the way that it is and we'll spend eternity with Jesus Christ in a place called heaven. Oh, yes, I'm so old-fashioned, I really believe in heaven. I believe in heaven. I believe in hell. And I'm adamant about Not wanting anybody to go there. These crowns are what you and I will receive. Unlike the great white throne judgment, the judgment seat of Christ will be a time of rejoicing for the believer. We'll be celebrating that Jesus has looked at our work and He's saying, Wow, good job that you did. Here's the crowns that you've earned. We walk into the kingdom of God. For that thousand years with Him. You've waited patiently for this day. Some of you have endured hard times and hard trials. 
but you've waited. And now the day is here for you. Well done. The rewards that Jesus will be giving, they're called crowns. The five that I've mentioned. I'm not going to go into detail about them. I'll give you the, if you got a pen real quick, imperishable crown. 1 Corinthians 9, 24, 25. The crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. The crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4 and 8. The crown of glory, Romans 8, 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. A crown of life, 1 John 2, 25, James 1, 12. Take time and look them up and read them. That's what you're going to receive. When your works have been tested of what you've done in the body in this world. So what am I wanting you to understand out of this message today? Because I know it's been a very hard one. What I want you to understand, Jesus Christ gave you a gift, and it's salvation. Nobody can take that away from you. The enemy can't take it from you. But Jesus wants to give you rewards. And those rewards are going to be based on what we do in this body, in this world, right now. So if... You're complacent and you think, well, I'm saved and that's all that matters. I'll go to church every now and then. I'm telling you, you won't receive all the crowns. But if you are diligent to work for God and do what God would have you do, then you will stand before him and he will give you the rewards of the crowns. And you'll rule with him for that thousand years. That's what I want more than anything. I guess I could sum it up this way. James makes the statement. He said to be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Do the word. Speak the word. Be actively involved in the word of God. Don't just listen and be, wow, that was good. Be a doer of it. That means love people when they don't love you back. That means walking an extra mile for someone that in your heart doesn't deserve four steps. It means being there, being different. I'm challenging us. One of my main responsibilities as your pastor, first of all, I care for your soul. That's why sometimes if I seem hard, that's just how it is. Because I care for your soul. Second of all, I'm responsible to feed the sheep. To the best of my knowledge and my ability, I I feed the Word of God. I stay away from my own opinions as much as I possibly can. Not that I'm not influenced by some of them, because some of them have been traditional and they've been in my life ever since I can remember. But I try my best to stay away from them and not have them influence me. But one of my responsibilities is to equip you for the work of the ministry. To help you do what God has called you to do so you can stand before that judgment seat of Christ and receive your rewards. So as I said earlier, sometimes I may have to come and say, you've got that gift, you need to use it more. Or you've got that gift, but you're using it a little bit too much in the flesh. You need to surrender it more to the Spirit. It's not a rebuke. It's an equipping and a training. Kenny, I'm sure that In your years on the fire department, there's been a lot of guys that were over you that have come to you and said, hold the hose different or drive the truck, do whatever. Do it differently. It wasn't criticism, but it was instruction. 
so you could do a better job and, in some cases, not get hurt while you're trying to do your job. So that's part of my responsibility. These things are for you today. I'd like to go into all of these, but time won't permit. And I feel like the Lord just saying, Paul, you've said enough today. Let them take it home. Let them pray on it. That's what I'm going to do. If you see a little bit different me in some ways over the next month or two, a couple months, it's okay. It's okay. God is talking to me more and more now than he has in years. And he just, bottom line, he just said, Paul, I've given you some more time, so how are you going to use it? So I'm determined to use it the best I know how. That's all. So where before I may have blinked at something, I ain't going to blink no more. (laughs) Where before I may have said it'll all work out, no, I may probably jump right in the middle of it. (laughs) I want to do what God wants us to do. I want us to be a strong church. I want us to be a powerful church (laughs) for God's glory to build his kingdom. Amen. I just want you to stand with me. Now, don't get used to this. I mean, it's five minutes to 12, so don't get used to that. Geneva. Amen. Praise God. Awesome, Geneva. Awesome. Well, Ben, Debbie, if you're watching, uh, I'm sure you are. Healing from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. Uh, Just, uh, I know God is bringing you through, and we give you praise and glory. Uh, Norma, um, we're holding you up in prayer, and Keith as well. Uh, Keith's strength and oxygen will return. And uh, he'll be out of the hospital very quickly. So, Father, we lift up these precious members of our church. And, Father, we speak healing into their physical bodies right now. Lord, how much we love you. And, Lord, how much we thank you for the miracles that you perform every day in our life. Touch these precious men and women. Heal them by the power of the blood of Jesus. And if you're watching us online and you're sick in body, or maybe you have come down with the, the COVID, listen, Jesus heals all manner of sickness and disease. We rebuke it in Jesus' name. We speak healing in your body, and we give you praise and honor and glory in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I'll give you just a moment. You don't know Jesus. Bow your heads right now and say, Jesus, come into my life. Amen. Amen. And Father, we give you all the praise and all the glory. And we thank you, Lord, for this day. And Lord, for many that are traveling this weekend, because of the Labor Day, or they're with family, Bless them and give them a wonderful weekend. And Lord, bring them home safely to us, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. We decree. Kemp, Kaufman, Lake Area, and the world shall be saved.